I noted uh, looking at Ballotpedia is, you know, this is a district who's been represented by a Republican for a long time. Uh, he's, in fact, mm -hmm. been unopposed mm -hmm. since 2010, I think. But it looks like there's a lot of registered Democrats in the district. And, the, you know, mm -hmm. so is this something that's shifting? Is this something where there's Democrats who don't vote? What does the district kind of look like? Yeah, so, um, you know, it's interesting. I The way I think about our district is it's really a cross-section in many ways of New Mexico and of Albuquerque, and it includes sort of people of all different backgrounds, all socioeconomic places in life. We're, like I said, in the Northeast Heights, and we're pretty near um, an Air Force base and a national laboratory. And so we have a lot of folks who are work for the federal government or work for contract entities that are affiliated with the labs in the base. So it's very highly educated. Um, a lot of people work, like I said, as civil servants. They're very plugged in. They're aware of what's going on. But uh, we also have a significant portion of our district that is working people. There's a major commercial corridor that goes right through the middle of it. And in part of our district, we have a lot of mixed income housing, a lot of families. There's a lot of international families that are in our area. And so it really is a sort of cross-section of everything from, you know, working families that are struggling to get by to really upper income folks who live in um, really nice neighborhoods against the mountains. But in terms of kind of the political makeup, it's interesting. Yesterday, actually, NPR had a story about uh, about um, community development, and they had re they were covering this atlas that had been created to look at opportunity. And you can actually go you can go down to the level of census tracts and actually look at what communities look like. And so I was looking at it last night for our district, and it, the socioeconomics follows the politics. So as you get into the parts of our community where folks are a little more upper income, you know, uh, older, you tend to see voting patterns that are more conservative. And when you get more into the working neighborhoods, they tend to be more, more democratic. But what I would say in general and just politically about our district is my theory is that our district has already um, shifted that it's already um, it's already flipped, but because there hasn't been down ballot Democrats running in the last several elections, um, it hasn't been reflected. But in 2016, our district actually voted for Hillary Clinton with Gary Johnson taking 11 percent of the vote in our district. So I think that gives you a real sense that um, you know we do, and and our congresswoman who's actually running for governor here in our district uh, did really well in our district as well, but. The thing for me is I'm I'm really interested in issues and how do we make our state and our community better and um, really focused on not making this in any way, shape or form about partisan politics. And I think people on all sides of all ideological spectrums are really frustrated and disillusioned about politics right now. And I know I am as well. And so I'm really focused on how do we make change that's actually meaningful that'll make our communities better. And here in our community, we've knocked over 10,000 doors over the last eight or nine months. And there's really three issues that just come up over and over and over again. And one is crime. We're having really terrible crime waves in Albuquerque right now. But a lot of that is tied to economics and a lack of opportunity and people getting in trouble and um, a lot of drug abuse that's been happening. The second issue, which I think is nationally, you know, that people are focused on is education. But it, especially in our state, we had a lawsuit a few months ago that was decided that found that due to the way our state is currently managing our education and our education programs that uh, and the way resources are being allocated, that um, children were actually are being denied their constitutional right to uh, an adequate education because money was being taken away from low performing schools. And so our public school system here in New Mexico is really in bad shape and our teachers are some of the lowest paid in the entire country. And our schools are just really struggling as a result of it. And the third issue, which is tied to both of those, is really the economy. And I think, you know, I just mentioned that New Mexico's you know, 49th and 50th and all these indicators 
but we just, our economy really, really struggles. And um, I actually think that's one of the things that we can be, we can impact most by having more folks in the state legislature making policies that benefit our local economy. Because New Mexico has tended to try to attract outside companies to come to New Mexico to provide jobs rather than focusing our attention on investing and providing tax incentives to New Mexico-based businesses and growing our economy from it within. And I strongly believe, having grown up in a working family, that if you provide opportunity and capacity building and help people take their dreams and turn them into businesses, that that is the best way to grow a community. And will help address all the other issues that, that happen in the community as well. So it looks like in 2016, you and your opponent were both um, unopposed in your primaries, but you got almost almost twice as many votes as you did. So can you just talk a little bit about sort of your strategy that was obviously very successful and sort of what you see as your path to victory? Yeah, you know, so I think that in, in, if you look at the data across New Mexico for the primary, we actually had a very large turnout of Democrats for the primary all across the state. And it's a little bit hard to know if that was because of enthusiasm and motivation for Democrats to vote sort of at large the way we've been seeing across the country, or whether um, it was because we had so many contested primaries on the Democratic side and the Republicans did not, because we had both a contested primary for the gubernatorial and for the congressional race. So I think some of that is what drove the, the large turnout for the primary. But what I'll say about our strategy and the way that we've organized our campaign is that this is really, truly a grassroots community-based campaign. I think I said earlier, I'm, I'm a sociologist by my background, and I'm very interested in community organizing and social movements. And how do you really mobilize and empower people to get involved in the process? So early on in our campaign, Starting last year, when I stepped in to run, there had already been all this groundwork laid in the community by people who had been doing what I call kitchen table organizing over the last couple of years. And it was people literally in their homes talking to each other saying, you know, we want to do something. We want to bring some change. We would like to try to get a new representative for our community. And so uh, there had already been a lot of work happening of people doing that kind of organizing inside their homes and talking to each other. So when we started, we very consciously said, let's look at the map and see how we can create a network of community leaders across the entire district and bring in as many resources as possible to help train people on community organizing and on the political process so that we can mobilize together. And so starting early in the spring, we actually brought in folks to help teach how to do canvassing, how to do community organizing. We started holding regular meetings and really identifying who are the community leaders in every neighborhood and how do we cultivate that leadership and work together to to mobilize a, a movement across our district. So we, we've been very intentional about that from the very beginning and very intentional about this being a community-driven and grassroots effort. So um, that continues to this day. We have people canvassing and making calls and organizing house parties in every single neighborhood in the district. And that's how we've been able to reach so many people and I think why so many people have been really inspired and um, excited to get involved because there's a space for everybody and a space for everybody to use their skills and talent and aspirations and dreams to, to be a part of this movement. And it's, if I am lucky enough to serve, it's what I would like to continue into the policymaking process because New Mexico has a volunteer citizen legislature. So there's no, you don't get paid as a legislator and there's no paid staff. And so how do you how do you think up the big ideas that will actually bring transformational change? And so I'm really interested in 
how do we take this expansive and amazing network of people that have gotten engaged in the process and use their knowledge and wisdom to help develop new policies and new ideas and keep them engaged in, in the legislative process. You have a, a ton of endorsements, including uh-huh. uh, just recently Barack Obama. Congratulations. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> Very exciting. <laughs> yeah, but, you know, perhaps even more exciting within the community is just the, the number of local organizations and especially local unions that have endorsed mm-hmm. you. Can you talk a little bit about building that relationship with uh, the firefighters and the trades councils and the clerical association and, and all of those yeah. Sorry, how you've sort of built community around that. Oh, absolutely. And I have to say the firefighters endorsement in particular, I, I don't know, there's something about, you know, you grow up as a kid, you know, always admiring firefighters. And when I found out that I got that endorsement, I literally cried. <laughs> and when I went down there to meet with them, I wouldn't, I couldn't stop hugging them. I was so excited and, and so moved um, that they, that they endorsed our campaign. And I really feel so strongly that it's a testament to the amazing work that people have done in the community community to mobilize this community to run a successful campaign. You know, I grew up, like I said, my family worked in the trades. And so those are my people, you know, I grew up operating heavy equipment, doing landscaping and digging ditches and laying pipe. And I did an undergraduate degree in the natural sciences. But when I moved back to New Mexico in my 20s, I actually went back to school and took trade school classes and took things like welding and electronics and stuff. So I think for me, it was natural to reach out to unions and organizations that represent folks in the trades and unions and organizations that represent community organizations and workers because just how I grew up. But also because my mother had worked for a union when I was an infant. And one of the things that I think is such an amazing story, and I've been going through old photographs since I've been running, is I found these amazing photographs of my mom from the early 80s uh, where she was working as a crane oiler, as a crane mechanic at a power plant. And, you know, my mom's a seamstress, so I was really surprised when I found these pictures and I was like, how did this happen? And at the time, my mom was doing a lot of odd jobs. A lot of New Mexicans have to do a lot of jobs to sort of make ends meet. And so she was sewing and she was working for like services for the blind and she was working as a union dispatcher. And she said to me that she dispatched herself because they needed somebody to work at the power plant. And she figured, you know, a crane is just like a giant sewing machine. So she thought she could figure it out. And so she dispatched herself to go work as a crane mechanic and spent several years up at the San Juan power plant as a crane mechanic doing that. So I think that, you know, the reason I'm telling this story is is that I think that, you know, it's part of the process politically that um, candidates do reach out to different organizations and seek endorsements. But for me in particular, it's been really meaningful to meet all these amazing people who work in the trades and who are active through their unions and who are really the people who are mobilizing communities around, you know, workers' rights and economic development. And it's just been a tremendous honor to be able to do that. So, you know, it's some of it is just what candidates do. And I'm as a first time candidate, I'm, I'm learning the process as I go. But a lot of it is just showing up and contacting organizations and telling them your story and explaining to them what you're trying to do. And I think for many people, my stories and experiences really resonate because they're so similar to so many families here of people who, you know, grew up in families that struggled to make ends meet, who, you know, worked hard every day, but sort of struggled to ever get ahead. And, and so I think as I've been out meeting with different community organizations, I think that people feel engaged and want to get involved in this campaign because it feels like it's not just about politics. It's about the future of our state. And it's about, you know, having a homegrown grassroots campaign that you can really believe in. That's that's about trying to mobilize change for the right reason. So, Melanie, is there anything else that you want to make sure to talk about? Yeah, I think, you know, I think the thing that I would maybe leave the listeners with 
is something that I often say about why people should be paying attention right now in politics. And I call it my PHE so I can remember it. 